You're listening here to an alien spacecraft from the Pleiades star cluster arriving over the forests of northern Switzerland. If a rural caretaker, Edward Billy Meyer, who produced the recording, is telling the truth. Billy Meyer, now a recluse, is prominent among a number of people in different countries who have claimed friendly contact with beings alien to our planet. Another is Claude Ryle, a former French motor racing driver, who says he first encountered advanced humans from another part of our galaxy in a remote area of central France. Yeah, you saw in the sky a very strong flashing light and then uh, something like a, a flattened bell made of a very shining silver metal appeared and was slowly coming down and without any noise. So and it, it stopped at about 30 meters from me. Then a trapdoor was slowly opened and a, a small human being appeared and came straight to me. And first thing I was watching is Hans. And I was a little bit relaxed by the fact he had no gun, no weapons. If there was any gun, I think I would run and escape from this place. Both Claude Ryle and Billy Meyer maintain that their extraterrestrial contacts began over 20 years ago. But the first man to attract international attention as a so-called contactee was George Adamski, an American living in California. Adamski claimed he met the occupants of a UFO that landed in the desert near his home in 1952, and until his death in 1965, he toured the world speaking privately to national leaders and giving public lectures about that encounter. The space people actually not any kind of spooks or spirits. They are human beings like you and I. These ships land here every now and then, not very often, but when they do, the pilots of those ships and the occupants of them come right into the dining room and we dine with them. But in the government in the world today, small or big, that had not been visited by the space people of one planet or another, I can guarantee you that. Because their evidence is open to interpretation, such verbal assurances by contactees like George Adamski have never won sustained public acceptance. So the question remains, has contact ever truly been established with beings from other worlds? Both Meyer and Adamski produced vivid photographs of flying saucer UFOs, but many sceptical investigators have dismissed these as fakes. Hoaxes by others have also muddied the waters, Yet, 30 years after his death, supporters like airline pilot Glenn Steckling continue to insist that fair-haired extraterrestrial human beings gave George Adamski a specific mission. He was uh, chosen to contact as many official organizations, both on the religious side and on the governmental side, as possible, which he did. I think the what people have to understand is if they wish to believe something, or if they wish to find the truth in something, they have to look to it for themselves. If they look at the Adamski pictures, who have gone through orthographic projection, biometric radiation, pixel analysis, they have always stood the test of time and analysis through each decade's worth of technology. This irks a great many people, because he has clear pictures, he took many pictures, and he gave it to everyone. What exactly, though, did they want conveyed? What sort of information were they trying to give to the governments and uh, officials they wanted contact? Basically, we had come upon the atomic age, and we were conducting experimentations with things that we had no idea what we were doing. We are literally threatening the very existence of our planet through our indiscriminate testing. And they wanted to make us aware that there is potential to change the direction of our society should we so desire. I think he wrote that he was taken in their craft at different times and taken to the other planets in our solar system. Did he ever talk to you about that? Yes, he was taken on board craft. On many times he recognized officials of both uh, the U.S. government and of other world countries on some of these crafts as well. He saw other representatives of this planet on these ships and under these circumstances, they either were had meetings with these extraterrestrials and uh, they shared certain experiences together. Difficult to prove, but uh, nonetheless, he talked about it. And uh, whether they went together to the different planets or whatnot, those are questions that only George could have answered. Captain Glenn Steckling, who I talked to at the recent UFO World Congress in Dusseldorf. 
Back in England, I consulted Timothy Good, a best-selling UFO writer whose books are praised for their meticulous research and careful documentation. He has investigated a number of claimed contactees, and he finds George Adamski's photographs of alien spacecraft impressive. I'm absolutely convinced that his photographs and films are genuine. His 8mm movie films, particularly the one taken a few months before he died um, at Silver Spring, Maryland, in the company of three other witnesses, is quite extraordinary, and I have no hesitation in saying that that is absolutely authentic. It's also been authenticated by an optical physicist, and uh, we've discussed details at length. It turns out that the craft was about 27 feet in diameter. It describes a series of bizarre maneuvers during which it appears to change shape. I've also spoken to other people all over the world who claim to have had fully consciously recalled contact and sometimes trips with uh, extraterrestrials who I find totally convincing. You yourself have written in some of your books that you believe um, people from other planets are walking around among us and that you have had contact with them. Now, that to many people is going to sound bizarre, weird, to say the least. But you yourself, I think, describe an encounter in New York in a hotel lobby. How did that happen? I did. This was in 1967, in February. I was with the London Symphony Orchestra at the time. We were playing concerts in the Carnegie Hall, which was very nearby this, what was then called the Park Sheraton Hotel. I decided to try an experiment. I sat down in the hotel lobby and... I said, well, I'll give this a couple of hours, see what happens. And I beamed out these messages. You know, if there are any of you guys in the New York area, come down and sit sit next to me and prove it. Anyway, eventually, after about half an hour, a fellow comes in, immaculately dressed, dark grey suit, dark tie, white shirt, glasses, looked about 35. Everything he did was in a, a sort of deliberate manner. He had an attaché case, which he opened slowly. But he came and sat down beside me and I thought right I'll try my luck so again in my mind I said right if you're from somewhere else please take your right index finger and hold it to the side of your nose and no sooner had I thought that than he did precisely that well of course I was dumbfounded and I you know being English and reserved you know what the English are like you know we don't speak to anybody unless we've been introduced so I let it go at that I possibly lost the chance of a lifetime, but something strange happened. Although there was no verbal communication, it had a shattering effect on my life. It added, it sort of acted as a tremendous inspiration to to my researches. Now, I can't prove that story to anybody. You could say, well, of course, it was just a telepathic Earth person. Maybe it was. But it's very interesting that um, other people have described similar type of beings the quality of the eyes, the quality of the skin texture, very refined, well-proportioned features and so forth. I haven't sort of talked about that a great deal, certainly not to the press, uh, very seldom on radio, because of fear of ridicule. And that's the same worldwide. Timothy Good making his own slender claim of personal contact with an alien in crowded New York City. A Mexican photographer, Carlos Diaz, is another who believes that beings from beyond our planet are living anonymously among us. After snapping spectacular UFO pictures above forests near Mexico City some years ago, he claims he began to meet their occupants, and in Dusseldorf, through his English-speaking wife, he explained what they looked like. He says they're just like us. He knows... They've told him that they have made changes in their cell structure, in their information, genetic information, to be more alike us, in order to move around us and live with us so they can understand better what we are. Do they live here on Earth? Yes. Where do they stay? Where do they sleep? Where do they live? They have houses, they have cars, they drive, they look like normal people. How do we tell the difference if we meet one? There isn't. The única diferencia que yo encuentro, sí, es esa sensación muy especial en el plexo solar. He says he feels a difference. He feels in his solar plex this uh, funny feeling like being in love. So we can be in the supermarket and then when he begins to feel that feeling, 
he turns around and he might see one and they just wave at him and they go each one their way. They're here and they respect life most of all. So there is nothing to be afraid of. What is the result of all these extraordinary experiences which you're having, Carlos? What, uh, what has it all led to? Why are you here at this Congress? I am here now because I want to open people's mind for people to act for the preservation of life on our planet. That ambition of Carlos Diaz echoes similar sentiments expressed by the Swiss caretaker Billy Meyer, who made this alleged recording of a Pleiadian beam ship. But because ufologists have often accused him of perpetrating various hoaxes, the reclusive Meyer will no longer speak to journalists. Guido Moosbrugger, a school teacher in Meyer's village outside Zurich, is one of a small group of supporters who continue to send details of his claims to governments and universities around the world. Through an interpreter, Guido Moosbrugger told me that until very recently, human aliens from the Pleiades had various bases here on Earth. One station was high up in the mountains in Switzerland, the second in the United States, and the third in the Asian region. The number and the amount of people who were working at the installations, the highest number, is 2,862 persons. Now, Guido, you say that um, there were nearly 3,000 people here in these bases. How long were they here and why were they here? What were they doing? They were here for 20 years, starting in 75 in January up to 95 January. The main task was to increase and to speed up the spiritual development of mankind. They have told us there are three points that we should make very clear as we travel around the Earth talking about this subject. The first point is the absolute overpopulation of this planet. We should not have more fi than five billion people on this planet. Second point is the nuclear power, which is much more destructive and dangerous than uh, what the governments tell us. Because there's radiation that scientists cannot measure. And the third point? The general pollution of the planet Earth. The water, the air. They have a very specific interest uh, concerning Earth. Scepticism about contact reports is widespread because such claimed experiences are subjective and exclusive. But in talking to Stanton Friedman, a former nuclear physicist who has been investigating UFOs professionally for over 30 years, I wondered if it was wise to give so little attention to what these people have to say. Well, I see no reason to listen to them until they can provide any evidence that what they're saying is true. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary investigation. When I hear somebody tell me, well, I'm sure he was telling the truth because he was so sincere, I say, throw that out, give me evidence, don't tell me about sincerity, it's not good enough. I'm not saying that everything these guys are saying is nonsense, so who would disagree with the fact that we should do a better job of protecting our planet? Uh, you know, that goes without saying. I think these guys have their own objective. We've always had cults with us. There, there hasn't been a year in man's history in the last 300 years where there haven't been some kind of cults around. But I'm an evidence-driven person. So my goal is, is different from that. I'm not trying to be a religious uh, cultist or leader. But I do think we do need to recognize that a couple of things. One, man's future does lie in space, whether we like it or not. We're not limited to this planet. There is more to the galactic neighborhood than our planet. There's a whole solar system out there. So I think one of the major reasons for aliens coming here not to say, hi guys, how can we help you? But to say, we're not going to let you leave until you get your act together. You're a primitive society whose major activity is tribal warfare. How else would you describe this planet? If you look at the, the priorities on this planet, every day this past year, 35,000 children have died needlessly of preventable starvation and disease. That's a problem when we spent collectively three quarters of a trillion dollars on things military. That, that year. That would have fed all those kids 20 times over. So I think the cult groups uh, may have a place and perhaps they lead us in causing awareness. Stanton Friedman. 
Helping to increase awareness of the cosmic dimension to our lives is certainly the confessed intention of Claude Ryle. He says that beings who first contacted him near Clermont-Ferrand in 1973 called themselves Elohim and told him they had created all life forms here on Earth using advanced DNA techniques. He says he was given a mission to spread this information and eventually set up an embassy for them in neutral territory where they can one day land and meet government leaders and the world's media. Ryle also says the Elohim, small, Asiatic-looking human beings, took him to their planet late in 1975. I talked to him as he celebrated the 20th anniversary of this claimed event in the Perigord region of southwest France. Surrounded in a sunlit glade by hundreds of his supporters, he described how he had felt when one of the Elohim first spoke to him. When he was telling me this story, I was much more impressed by the message than by the, the flying vessel. It's so fantastic, uh, you know, to un suddenly understand that there is a third way to explain our origin. Before these messages, there was only two ways to explain our origin. The first one is a supernatural God coming on and with, you know, like a magic stick creating life. The second way being uh, evolution and Darwinism and no more. And suddenly a message comes and say, another way, the third way, human being coming from another planet and creating us thanks to DNA and genetic combination. And for me, it looked a lot more logical than the other one. I couldn't uh, agree with both of them before. You say the Elohim created human beings on Earth. Yes. One question that instantly arises in my mind and many others is, who created them? Yeah, and this is, uh, we have to be back to infinity, infinitely small, uh, and infinitely large are same, meaning the atoms and the electrons are same like galaxies moving around, and it's the same thing. And the Elohim were created by people coming from another planet, and these people were created by people coming from another planet, and we human beings will go to another planet and we will create life. But we, we are human, we are born one day, we will die one day, our matter is eternal. There's a lot of cults growing in the world. Why should people listen to the Rileyan movement and Claude Ryle any more than anybody else who's uh, proposing seemingly fringe solutions to the world's problems? Because I think it's good to go around and try w what is on the market and compare and taste the fruits. I never try to change peop other people or to, or to convince. I'm just trying to reach the right people at the right place and to create a network of people to work for, to prepare the, the embassy to welcome the Elohim. And now we have a wonderful network in 84 countries, 35,000 people around the world. And even when the Elohim will come, not everybody will, will believe they are our creators. And new generation, young generation, they need this kind of uh, spiritual solutions to be in harmony. We need to feel related to the infinity, related to the stars, to the galaxies, and to ourselves. And uh, this uh, religion is making people happy. Not only an explanation of our origin, but also, and more important, a link to yourself and a link to your universe. Claude Ryle has never produced photographs or any other physical evidence but he has written books about his claimed experiences which make clear that his organization's mission is religious and that he sees his own role as messianic. He also says he brought back meditation techniques which he teaches at seminars around the world to help people become more aware of their relationship with the cosmos. It's 20 years since you stepped off the Earth here at Rock Pla. Yes. What's the planet of the Eternals, as you call it? What you does know, it look like? Look, it looks like Caribbean islands. This kind of uh, 
beautiful uh, tropical island uh, with uh, huge trees with flowers and fl fruits at the same time and small animals. No animals are afraid of you. They all come and you can touch them. For it's heaven. There's no violence, no money, no jealousy. Everybody is so wonderful, so full of love. It's heaven, except if you are really deeply masochist. You don't want to come back. There are other people who have claimed to have had contact with people from other planets. Uh, people like George Adamski in the 50s, whose name you may know. Billy Meyer in Switzerland. Uh, how do you differ from them, if you differ from them? It's uh, very, very different. Of course, I want to start by saying that messengers are not important. And what is important is the message. But uh, all other ones, they are mixed with belief, religious belief in God or something like that. The only one messenger in this century is the one you are speaking to now. The earth is the, the private garden of the Elohim. And nobody except them is coming on the earth. So you're saying that no other visitors from other planets come here on the earth at all? Nobody. But how do you explain then the fact that all over the world today people are coming forward to psychologists and scientists saying that they feel they've been abducted by aliens, taken into spacecraft, interfered with, fetuses taken from their yes. wombs and so on. Is this the Elohim? No, never. No, all these things are not true, but I want to speak about that. It's very important. It's a conspiracy of uh, American militaries and the uh, uh, CIA. They tried to create an uh, enemy. So they try now to make human beings afraid of invaders from space, spreading false information, disinformation, trying to exploit uh, people who are psychically debalanced, which is terrible because people from space are always friendly, full of love. They love us. They are our creators. There is no one abduction on the earth and they have never been and they will never be. Talking with people like Claude Ryle, who claimed contact with extraterrestrials was often like sailing in uncharted waters. So, to move back towards more familiar shores, I decided to consult Nick Pope, who, until recently, was the chief UFO investigator at the Ministry of Defence in London. But although he's still a civil servant, he's an unconventional one, because he's soon to publish a controversial book about his findings in that job, called open skies, closed minds. And I asked him if he felt that testimony of so-called contactees contributed anything to understanding the UFO phenomenon. I think that a lot of these people, and, and particularly I'm thinking of Adamski, have been widely criticised and discredited over the years. But if you look back at the Adamski story, I, I think there's a good deal more truth in it than many might realise. I'm not saying, of course, that there aren't some outrageous hoaxes. Of course there are. But some of these experiences undoubtedly are genuine. And, of course, again, it's the easiest thing in the world to say, I think your story is rubbish, prove it. Perhaps the question should come back to these people. Will you prove it didn't happen? You've also investigated uh, the abduction phenomenon, which is something which is being widely reported in the United States, in the United Kingdom, Europe, other countries of the world. What do you conclude about that? It's very difficult to say, and, and it's a, an extremely difficult area. But again, I think although in a number of cases you can find perhaps conventional explanations, there is amazing testimony from all around the world, often quite independent. The witnesses have no contact with each other, and yet time and time again the same stories emerge. So you investigated these things as part of your job at the Ministry of Defence, so governments do know that these abduction cases are being reported? Certainly, yes, there are reports on the Ministry's files, simply because people do from time to time write in and say that they have interacted with entities. However, I think it's probably true to say there's really no government policy on abductions. It falls under the general heading, I think, as with UFOs, of them saying that there is as yet no hard evidence to support this. And in a way, that's right, because until you've got, as it were, the smoking gun, you can't say that any of this, UFOs, abductions or whatever, is proved beyond a shadow of a doubt. What I think you can do is build up a very effective case for it. As a result of four years of researching the UFO phenomenon generally for the Ministry of Defence, you've come to some startling and controversial conclusions. What are they? My main conclusions are that although we can explain away perhaps 90% of what are commonly called UFOs, 
I have concluded that perhaps 5 or 10% of these things are extraterrestrial in origin. And yes, as you can imagine, that's made some waves in one or two quarters. There's talk of a congressional committee in the United States where people who could come forward from their professional jobs and be absolved from their secrecy um, commitments to come out into the open about all this. Do you think we're close to seeing some big admission of what is known about uh, the UFO phenomenon? I'm not sure, but I'd like to think that a body such as the United Nations could perhaps draw together strands from all around the world and could have expert testimony from military personnel, scientific personnel, and of course, most importantly, from, from the public themselves who, who have actually experienced these things and come out with some sort of overview of what's going on. But I think it does need someone from within the world of officialdom to take this issue by the scruff of its neck to, as it were, rid it of the, the sort of rather silly tabloid tag that it has and to treat it with the seriousness that it actually deserves. Nick Pope, ex-UFO investigator for the British Ministry of Defence. At the end of my own investigation, I personally feel sure that extraterrestrial craft are visiting us. Why they're coming, where they're from, and who's inside them is very much open to conjecture. Conflicting evidence I've gathered won't reconcile into any single coherent picture. For me, the abduction phenomenon is the most disturbing aspect of this whole subject. Something extraordinary is clearly happening worldwide because growing numbers of people are independently reporting these distressing abduction experiences. But I can't yet define, even for myself, what's behind these reports. Some important explanatory element seems to be missing. So, I believe coordinated, compassionate, international research into the abduction enigma is urgently needed. But these abduction stories aside, do we already have civilised contact with alien beings? However fantastic this might sound, after weighing all the evidence carefully, I'm convinced that some contacts have already taken place, both with private individuals and at high official levels. Of course, there's no outright public proof, but the official contacts, and much more besides, can, I believe, have been concealed by our obsessively secretive governments. In coming to these conclusions, I don't want to try and tell you what to think. It's up to each and every one of us to test out for ourselves what is fact, fiction or fantasy on this vitally important subject. But if we're going to uncover the ultimate truth about UFOs, we must all go on asking our own questions. <laughs> <laughs>